Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, show number eight. Welcome to a real world MBA from the School of Hard Knocks, where entrepreneurs reveal what it really takes to make it. Whether you're already in business or you're on your way there, this show is for you. This is Bigger Pockets Business. Hey there, guys and gals. It's Jay Scott here, the co host of the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. I am here with my favorite person in the entire world. Ah, Carol Scott. How are you doing today, Carol Scott? I'm good, honey. That just made me so happy. Aww, Thank you. It is gotta, true. You are the sweetest. I've got to tell you, it's a really good thing I'm your favorite person in the world because we have a really, really long time in the car ahead of us. Yes. So we decided we are moving down to Florida. We've mentioned that before, but we realized the other day that because of the moving schedules, all these moving companies take two weeks up to two weeks to move our stuff just from DC to Florida. And Apparently it's a really popular route in the summer. Who would have thought? Who yeah, but not, thought? but not popular enough that they can get us down there quickly. So yeah, in, order kind of crazy. Get, in order to get all of our stuff down there, to, in order to get all of our podcast equipment down there and not be out of pocket for up to two or three weeks, we have decided that we're going to rent a 26 foot truck and we're going to drop <laughs> stuff down ourselves. So if you hear a story about um, some crazy 26 foot truck drop, on the highway, um, messing up traffic over the next week or two. That's probably me. Oh my gosh, do not jinx us. That is terrifying. Seriously <laughs> terrifying. It'll all be okay. It'll work out just fine. It, At least no. we've got movers to load us and unload us. That would, that would be the end of us. We would not survive that situation. Yeah, all. we'll be okay. We'll see how the kids do on our 16-hour car ride. <laughs> It'll be an adventure, like it, always. It another will. adventure. Okay, let's talk about our show today. On our show today, we have a woman named Christina Gillick. She is a professional copywriter. Now, if you don't know what copywriting is, she will explain what copywriting is. She'll also explain what it's not. And she'll explain how we can use copywriting to convert leads and sales in our businesses. And I don't know about everybody listening, but as a real estate investor or as real estate investors, Carol and I use copywriting all the time to buy and sell our properties. So in the show, Christina is going to tell us all about how we can use stories to help us sell. She's going to reveal the single most important question that we as business owners and copywriters need to ask in order to write great copy. And she'll also tell us a great way that we can practice our sales writing copy. And if you're looking to become a professional copywriter yourself, we're going to cover that as well. Also, make sure you listen all the way to the very end because you know what? Christina is going to give us her very, very best tip. And I'll tell you what, never in a million years would have thought of it. It's a really great one on how you can write better copy. She's also going to tell you some websites that you can check out if you want to see how the experts write. Absolutely. Now, before we jump into the show, Carol and I really just want to honestly and sincerely thank everyone out there who's taking the time to review the show. Thank to, you. Thank you. Thank you. To rate the show. The ratings are fantastic. The reviews are great. And we appreciate all the feedback. So thank you for that. Now, if you want to get more information about the show, if you want to find out the links that we're talking about in the show, make sure you check out our show notes at biggerpockets.com slash biz show eight. That's biggerpockets.com slash biz show eight. Alrighty, let's jump into our episode with Christina Gillick. Hey there, Christina. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for coming on with us. I'm so excited to talk to you all about copywriting. <laughs> so, yes. So that is what our show is about today. We're going to talk about copywriting. Christina, you are a professional copywriter. You're an expert on copywriting. You have a very successful copywriting business. Uh, but before we jump into more about who you are and what your business is all about, I'd love to get a really important question out of the way for our listeners. What is copywriting? And why is being a great copywriter so important for us as business owners? Okay. Well, uh, first, I want to say what copywriting is not. So copywriting is not, it doesn't mean that I help inventors protect their inventions against theft. It actually means that I write, W-R-I-T-E, copy. And so um, it's just all about writing, you know, pen or paper or your computer, however you write. And it's... You know, if you think about everything that you get in the mailbox, so um, fundraising letters, postcards from local businesses, anything that might come in your inbox, a copywriter 
wrote that. And I'm talking about your actual physical mailbox outside, even though I said inbox, but also to your email inbox, you know, emails that you get, um, things they want you to click another link to go to another page. Sometimes they're, you know, 20 pages long. All of those things are things that copywriters wrote. They can also write uh, brochures, catalogs, websites, emails, landing pages, social media ads, pretty much anything that convinces somebody to take an action is copywriting. And so um, it's all about persuading the reader to act, such as making a purchase or signing up for something. And so a lot of times you'll hear the words direct response copywriting. And what that means is that they're just, it's copy that's designed to get an immediate response, such as sign up right now or buy right now. And that's considered direct response copywriting, which is mostly what I do. And a lot of times people will call copywriting uh, salesmanship in print. And basically that just means they're making a sale with written words instead of, you know, calling on the phone or going door to door. Excellent. So I've, we have so many questions based on that intro. So thank you for setting the stage. But before we get to those questions, I'd love to go back to the beginning. So can you tell us about yourself and how you got into copywriting? Sure. So my first job after college was with a company that sold web design training online. And I didn't really even realize that, you know, selling training online was a thing. Um, and so I went to this job and that's pretty much where I learned about online business and then later about copywriting. And so my boss at the time, he um, hired a freelance copywriter to come in and he came there and he uh, talked about copywriting and marketing and just everything you'd want to know for three days. He went through the whole business and he was just like, these are the things you're doing wrong. These are the things you're doing right. Here's how you can fix it. And I just thought, wow, that was amazing. And also, you know, I learned a lot about his life and he had, I'm not sure at the time how many children he had. I want to say seven or so. I think he's up to 11 now. Um, and so he got to stay home with his kids and, you know, they homeschooled and they had this just wonderful life. And I said, okay, I want that. I don't know what he's doing, but I'm going to do what he's doing. And so, you know, I said to my boss, would that be okay if I go to this person and find out, you know, what they're doing? He said, oh yeah, sure. And I didn't really think about it at the time, but now, you know, looking back, he was probably like, well, yeah, if you learn to do it, I don't have to hire that guy to do it. You know, you already work here. So, um, I asked the freelancer that he had hired to come in and I said, you know, how did you get started? Will you teach me? What should I do? And he directed me to a training company that I went to and that's where, um, I took their initial course. I don't know if I'm allowed to promote them or say who they are. That's sure. fine. Whatever you got. Absolutely. Okay. So it's AWAI. That stands for American Writers and Artists. And so I took their introductory course and that's where I learned all about copywriting and persuasive copy. And so after that, I took what I learned and I actually became the staff copywriter for that job. And I worked there um, probably two years, you know, learning and trying what I had learned. And um, I wound up writing their daily email every day. I wrote multiple sales letters and web pages, web pages and things from there. And, um, but eventually, you know, I said, I, you know, want my own thing. I want to wake up when I want to wake up. I don't want to wake up to an alarm. And, you know, by then I was having to commute because we had moved and uh, it was taking me about an hour to get to work. And I said, I don't want to give up, you know, two hours a day to get there and get home. And so I said, I'm going to be self-employed. So I started working with other clients on evenings and weekends. And I did that. Um, I don't know, maybe six to nine months. And by then I was earning enough on evenings and weekends to replace what I was earning full time. And so at that point I made the leap. That's what they say in the, uh, the world where I learned about copywriting. And so I quit my job. And then that first year, um, I think it was August. And so I didn't have a lot of time left in that year, but I did replace my income that year. And then the first school year as a freelance copywriter, I made $86,000. Wow. And then it's gone up since then, every year since then. So that's Congratulations awesome. to you. What an inspirational story. That's very nice. Love it. So you had mentioned that there's at least one type of copywriting, which is immediate response, I think was the term you used. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us direct response? Direct response. Mm -hmm. So are there other types? So I assume copywriting is great for getting people to do things like sign up for, uh, provide an email or sign up for a mailing list. Um, then there are probably other types of copywriting that generate a uh, sale that are like basically a call to action. Are there, are there categories of copywriting? How do we, how do you like kind of segment copywriting based on what it's trying to accomplish? So a lot of writers, um, you'll come across their website and they'll say, I'm a content writer. And a lot of people who go into that, they don't really, they don't want to write sales. They don't want to convince somebody to part with their money, you know, so they just want to write content and things that, you know, a lot, it's a lot of it's for SEO. So, you know, you write things that get people to come to your website and you don't necessarily ask them to take an action immediately. You know, the goal is to get them to visit the website. Um, I personally think 
all copies should be direct response. I think if you're going to take the time to write and publish a blog post, you might as well have a call to action at the end. Um, and a call to action is simply asking them to do something like sign up or comment below. A lot of blog posts will say, you know, comment below how you feel about this thing. And so technically you are still asking for a response, even though it won't generate, you know, income. So. Okay, so you are you are asking for some type of call to action in one way or another, and that is kind of successful copywriting. So, I'm curious. So you've through your your background and until you you became a freelance copywriter, um, I would assume a lot has changed with the internet and everything. And I think a lot of our listeners are probably um, myself included. I did marketing and you know it was some, not good by any stretch of the imagination writing back in the day. So like kind of pre internet internet stuff. So would you say that throughout the years, the rules of copywriting has changed along with the internet or is it just the same as it was before but with a different twist? How would you say it's kind of evolved? So when I first started, uh, when I first discovered it, it was kind of in this transition of just becoming everything online. So when I bought the training course, I actually got the physical course mailed out to me, but I also got the online version. Well, within a couple years, nobody got the course mailed out to them anymore. So it was just right at that transition period. And so I learned a lot of, you know, old school direct mail where they would send out, you know, 10 page letters in the actual mail and say at the bottom, you know, if you're interested in this, write back to us, here's a reply card. And so that's kind of what I learned. Um, and then I took addition an additional course maybe six months later about web copy and that's all about you know when you're writing on the internet a lot of the stuff in there is the formatting you know you don't want to have giant chunks of paragraphs because people are gonna look at that and go Ugh, I don't have time for that you know so you just want to have short little snippets and you know bolded sections and stuff that's in italics and so all of that stuff wasn't really it didn't seem as important when I learned about the print version you know you would just italic make something in italics to um, you know, bring attention to it. Well, online, it can have the effect of bringing attention to it, but also, you know, it could be for SEO. So there's just some additional things, you know, when it comes to the reader online, you know, they, their attention spans shorter and they want to get through it more quickly and scan and stuff like that. And so when you're writing online, you have a lot more just breaking it up and making it easier to read. So you mentioned, and this, this, is, I, this is a great segue here because I've been mean to ask this question. Um, you mentioned that 10 page letter that you might get in the mail. Um, back pre-internet when, when it was more uh, physical mailing. So I notice a lot of, I guess you call them internet marketers, or maybe it's the copywriters for the internet marketers. We see these landing pages that go on and on and on forever. Like you, you think you've gotten to a call to action and then they have more. And then you think you get a call to action, you get a video and then a call to action and you get testimonials and, and, these ridiculously long landing pages as a consumer. I don't really like those, but I've noticed that a lot of internet marketers, a lot of copywriters do that. Those really tremendously long landing pages. Is that it, good copywriting as, as copywriters ourselves when we're doing this for a business, should we be focusing on really long sets of text or short snippets? I would say that the length um, should never really be that much of a concern. So I always say that the, you, you want to get enough information across for them to make a decision, but you don't want to overwhelm them or have, you know, just go off on tangents about things. So for a landing page, um, and I typically use the term landing page for uh, lead generation usually. So they go there and it says, hey, we'll give you this free ebook if you give us your name and email address. So for those, I try to say, you know, as short as it possibly can be to convince them to give their email address. Someone, you know, if they're going to give you their email address, they probably don't need 10 pages to convince them of why they would give you their email address. But if you ask them to spend a hundred dollars, they might need 10 pages to convince them to spend a hundred dollars. So it kind of depends on what you're selling and what you're asking them to do. So for a landing page, like you're talking about where they just generate a lead, I would say that it should be a headline and a couple paragraphs and then the form. And you want all of that to be, Traditionally, it was called above the fold, which is, you know, in the newspapers folded, it would be on the front, but on the internet, it's kind of like before the scroll. So they, you want them to see that immediately as soon as the page loads before they would scroll down. And so it's something to grab their attention, the headline, a little bit of ex explanation of what they're getting. It could be a video. If it's going to be a video. Um, and then the form to opt in and then everything else after that, um, if you want them to, so then I also want to talk about sales pages. So let's say they opt in. And then you send them an email and you say, okay, now there's this thing for you to buy. Go here to read about this thing to buy. So then they would go to that page and then that would potentially be the thing that's like 10 pages long. And that has to overcome any objections that they might have. 
and answer any you know questions they might have, give proof that what you're saying is true. So if you, you know, at the top of the page, if you're like, I'm going to show you how to make $50 this weekend, that might be pretty easy and it's believable. And so you wouldn't need a ton of copy. But if you were going to say, I'm going to show you how to make $50,000 this weekend, they're probably not going to believe you. So you're going to need a lot of copy, a lot of proof, a lot of testimonials, you know, other stories from other people, all the things you need to back that, back that up and make that argument that yes, you will teach them how to make $50,000 in the weekend. Excellent. I'm curious, you're talking about all the different examples of let's use the $50,000 in a weekend example. We're talking about all the content, all the testimonials, all the videos. How do you go about figuring really, and, and I, I'm, I know you mentioned already that you said it just depends on what that call to action is, depend upon how convincing it needs to, me, needs to be. How much, I guess, what is the right balance of like, I don't know if you can necessarily break it down into percentage, but how much of it should be written versus how much of it should be videos versus how much should be backed up with testimonials? Kind of, do you have kind of have a formula that you go into when you're copywriting? Well, so a lot of, um, you'll see it's called a VSL, a video sales letter. And a lot of companies use letter. just that. So okay. they, you know, you go to the webpage and it's nothing but a video. You can't rewind. You can't fast forward. All you can do is watch the video. And sometimes they'll be 45 minutes long. And that's, you know, a lot of clients and a lot of people, they say it's very effective. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes if you click the back button, it will like load the actual sales letter. So, you know, if you're like, oh, I don't like video and you press the back button, then it will say, oh, wait, here's the, you know, the copy you can read. Um, so typically, in the majority of the things I do and the majority of what I write for clients is um, it's either video or a sales letter. Sometimes they'll do, you know, video mailed out like through emails like, hey, we recorded this video for you. And then that video will just be short and sweet to try to get them to read the entire sales letter. Um, the only time I've really included video throughout the sales letter is if it's examples. So if they're going to get some sort of training and you want to show them an example of what it's going to look like, the format, you know, that kind of thing, you could include a small. And then sometimes also people will do like a welcome. But I kind of prefer just to like do the headline and get right into it without the video. Okay. I, I like that. Okay. <laughs> so go ahead, Jay. So uh, yeah, I was going to ask, you mentioned earlier about sometimes for certain types of, of copy, um, you need, for any copy, you need to overcome objections. But for certain types of copy, it's going to be more objections you're going to have to overcome. Would you say, and again, as Carol said, I don't know how you break this into percentages, but in typical copy, how much are you spending on trying to promote the benefits of what you're selling or, or trying to, to provide versus overcoming objections? How do you kind of figure out the right, um, the right percentages and break down there? Okay. So, um, this is kind of, so what we're talking about is a lot of longer copy. So uh -huh. for people who are listening, who might just gonna, you know, they're just gonna write a postcard. A lot of this doesn't apply. This is like, you know, if you're writing the 10 page letter, then you would go into this stuff. But um, so what I do for objections is it kind of comes not last, but maybe somewhere in the middle of my process. So what I will do is I'll kind of draft up what I'm going to say. And I'll say, you know, here's the headline. Um, and we, we also probably, should like talk about audience and how to know who you're writing to and stuff. So I'm just going to go into this a little bit. And then there's probably gonna be a lot of other questions about awesome. what you to say, <laughs> but so, um, you know, I'll write the, the headline and then the lead is generally, it's like a story at the beginning that kind of gets people into the body of the sales letter. So it might be, you know, a fact like, did you know this amazing fact? Or it could be, you know, late last night, Sarah was walking home from school when blah, blah, blah happened. And it's just, it's something designed to, you know, draw the reader in and get them to want to know more. So your headline might be, you know, I can show you how to turn $10 into $1,000 practically overnight. Mm -hmm. It's kind of scammy sounding. So you'd have to have a lot of proof. But so let's say that's your headline. Then your first paragraph, so your lead would start talking about maybe somebody who's done that. And here's a story of this person. And I'm going to show you exactly what they did. So you kind of draw them in with here's what you're going to learn. You're going to, I'm going to tell you exactly what this person did. And then you would get into the point where you say, here's how I'm going to tell you. It's a course you know, it's 95 pages or it's 10 videos or it's, you know, I'm going to hold your hand or whatever the course is. You kind of outline all of what they're going to get and how they're going to learn it. And then usually after that, you know, you have your guarantee. Um, well, you might, you'd have your pitch of what it costs. You know, it's only $200, but if you act now, it's only 99. And then um, you'd have your guarantee and then kind of like a little close at the end. Um, and then throughout that, so once you kind of have that drafted of here's what I'm going to say and here's how it's going to flow, I go back through and I read it and anywhere where I think the person might be like, no, 
Like you're fibbing. That's not true. There's no way. That's where I'd put an objection. So like, let's say, you know, you're going along and you say, and then, you know, Paul took his, you know, investment and he doubled it. And then everybody reading it is like, Psh, but I couldn't do that. Well, at that point you would say, and you can do it too. And here's how. And so you just kind of, you don't tell them they have the objection. You don't really bring up the objection. You just, you know, keep writing and just smoothly address what you think, address what you think may be in their head. That's interesting. That, so you're basically having a conversation throughout the copy. That's, that's, yes. that's the copy. It's, it's, I'm I probably should have led with that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like writing a letter to a friend. So if you think about that, you're going to convince your friend or your mom or somebody similar to buy this thing and you're going to sit down, you're going to write them a letter and you're going to tell them all the reasons why they would want this thing. And then also prove it, you know, any claims you make, you prove those claims. And then any stories you can share that prove that, you know, what you say is true and then ask for the sale and then give them, you know, risk reduction and guarantee and close. You always want to have a PS. Not entirely sure why now, because used to the reason you would include a PS is because people would immediately go to that sometimes to say, well, what's all this about? And no just kidding. Go, that would be the default. People would jump to the end to the PS. Yes. No and kidding. So, but now, you know, they have to scroll sometimes 20 pages to, to get, get to there. that. So it's probably not as important as it used to be, but you know, your PS can be something like, you know, and wait, if you act now, you'll also get this thing or, you know, don't forget that thing I said about this other thing. It's super important and it makes this really easy. You know, those kinds Excellent. of things. Excellent. So I want to, before we, we t I want to talk a lot more about audience because you mentioned that and how that is a really important consideration. But before yes. we do that, I want to kind of recap what you said, because I'm, I'm, formulating all this in my mind as you're talking through it. And I'm envisioning it very visually thanks to how you painted this picture. So it sounds like to, to recap a headline benefits, overcoming the objections, more examples, a call to action and a PS or a guarantee call to action guarantee and a PS is kind of the framework. Yep. That sound yep, about right. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes. Thank you we for painting that picture. That's really clear. Sure. Yeah, a lot of, um, you'll hear other things like, you know, picture proof promise that basically means like you paint the picture for them, you prove it, and then you promise the thing and that's where you ask for the sale. Um, so there's a lot of different outlines, I guess, depending on what you're writing. Some things, if, you're, if your audience is familiar with you already, you don't have to have as much proof. So like if you're going to a cold market and you're saying, hey, here's this thing you've never heard of me before, then you have to tell them who you are and why you can be believed. If you're going to somebody that they sign up for your list, they hear from you every day, then you don't have to tell them who you are because they already know. So that kind of, you know, depending on the, the letter will get longer, you know, the less that they know about you and are, you know, the yeah, colder just, they are, I guess, the longer sure. the letter gets. Yeah. Selling yourself in addition to the product, right? That's another right. whole element going in there. So let's um, go back to the different audiences. You mentioned that audience consideration is a big part of your copywriting strategy. So how do you go about identifying who those audiences are or do audiences, different audiences react differently to different type of copy? What do you have to take into consideration from that standpoint? Okay. So um, when you first, like before you write anything really, I like to, you know, kind of, it, it will depend on your business. So some people in their business, they may already know who their target market is. You know, they may say, oh yeah, our target market is men between 20 and 30 and they love fast cars and going to the movies or whatever. Right. And they know exactly who that person is. And sometimes when you work for clients, they'll know exactly who that person is and they'll tell you who it is. But if you don't know who it is, or you're starting a new company, like when we started Comfy Earrings, we it was like, I assumed it would be women. But, you know, I was wrong because we have a lot of other people that like them too. So, um, so sometimes it's going to be brainstorming and trying to, you know, figure out who your target market is. And then sometimes you're just going to know. So things you want to ask yourself and kind of find out is, um, you know, are they women or men? Are they young or old? Are they technology savvy or not? Because if you're trying to sell them something, you know, that has to do with technology, you might need a lot more proof for somebody who's like, no, I just don't know about technology to believe that you're going to be able to help them. Um, but it also goes beyond the list of like data points that you typically hear. So you also want to consider, and this is, this will be a lot easier if you are a member of your target audience or if you have been. So if you started a business because you had a problem that you wanted to solve um, or something like that, it'll be a lot easier to kind of drill down into this, but you want to consider, and you just like get off piece of paper and brainstorm these kinds of things. But um, what are their fears and desires and wishes and hopes and dreams? Like what do they think about all day long? And then like, I, a lot of times I hear this question, what keeps them up at night? 
a lot of famous copywriters say that that's what you should write about. Uh, what are they worried about or looking forward to or planning? And so knowing these things and understanding like the actual people that you're talking to um, is very important before writing anything. Like, you know, if you were going to write a letter to your best friend, it's going to be a lot different than a letter you're going to write to your mom. So just, you know, knowing who that person is and the kind of words they would use and the kinds of things that they would say um, is just going to help a lot when you start to write rather than just starting from nothing. And so I have some suggestions if you're not familiar with your audience and you want to get to know them better. Um, some research suggestions that I use are one thing is you can explore forums or anywhere where people ask questions, Twitter, those kinds of things where people are asking questions about the industry or market and then people are answering and replying. And you wanna look at both the questions and the answers and you'll start to see patterns of the things that people say, the phrasing they use. Um, another place is um, Amazon, the review section of Amazon. If, you, if there's a similar product or service there, or I guess not a service, but a product or a book or a course, um, you could go to Amazon and read the reviews there. And a lot of times you'll find uh, the way that people phrase things, but also, you know, they'll say, oh, well, I wish it would have included this, or I wish it would have had that. So if you're making a course about real estate, that would be a good place to learn other things to add. Another thing is that you can call and talk to these people. So if you've started a business and you have a few customers, you could call those customers and ask them, you know, why did they come to you? What do they like about it? What don't they like? And you can use their answers to kind of, you know, do more. And then another thing is you could create a focus group. So this could be if it's a super, super new product, you know, it could be friends and family. Uh, you do want to keep in mind, though, if you're selling, you know, earrings and the majority of your friends are guys without pierced ears, like you're probably not going to get the best feedback. So you do want to kind of make that focus group be people who would at least be semi-interested. That's great. Yeah, this is, and it's very similar to any company that's starting up that is thinking about selling a product and you have to do the same thing. You have to figure out the persona of your customer and it's basically defining what is motivating that customer, what their demographics are, their age, their uh, location, their maybe educational background, all the same things that you would use to define your, your customer persona. This is now your audience persona, which if you think about it, it should be pretty much the same thing because that audience eventually we're going to transition them hopefully to be our customers yes so that's that's a great way to think about it so I have a question mm -hmm. I am somebody who I have an engineering personality and I have an engineering background my personality is very uh, data-driven analytical linear and so when I write especially when I write copy I tend to focus more on fact than I do on emotion mm -hmm. so for me as a consumer I expect everybody to be like me, obviously. I, I think everybody wants to know all the facts. Nobody cares about the emotion. Obviously, that's not true. How do you determine how much of your copy should be facts and analytics and details and supporting evidence versus appealing to emotion and trying to really, um, I guess, do the more, for lack of a better term, the subliminal stuff? Um, so you definitely want to tell people the features of your product, right? But the copy is going to focus more on the emotions of like getting that feature, I guess, or the benefit of that feature. So you think about how you want your reader to feel when they read your copy. So if you're selling a real estate course, you probably want them to feel hopeful, right? That this is going to work for them. Or maybe you want them to feel frustrated with their current situation so that they feel compelled to get out of it. And so it, this will kind of depend on your company and um, I guess the way that you want your, like your personality of that company to be. Like if you want to make people think like, oh, well they frustrated me about this thing. That's okay. Some people are like, oh no, I just want to be all happy, happy all the time. So if you want to be happy, then you'd want your reader to feel, you know, hopeful. If you don't mind upsetting them a little bit, then, you know, you could create this frustration with their current situation that they have to be desperate to get out of. And so, uh, for instance, a lot of financial copy, which is, um, it's like a niche of, um, copywriting and it's used to typically to sell financial newsletters or investing information, things like that. And so a lot of financial copy will use fear and anger. And the reason for that is it's effective. <laughs> but um, so they might take, talk about someone that had been taken advantage of in their story, or they might talk about an enemy that, you know, wants to destroy your reader's health or wealth. Or maybe they write about an injustice that's happening. So before you get into the features of the product, you know, it's 50 pages long or this many hours or, you know, however, whatever the list of features is, before you get into all that, you want to tell them some stories to, you know, have an emotional response. And then, um, but once you tell those stories, you know, you're going to solve the problem for them. You're going to say, okay, like, here's the solution. It's the thing I'm selling, you know, it's my product. But the goal 
So the goal isn't to make them fearful or angry. The goal is to present your product or service as the solution for that fear or anger. And then, you know, ideally your reader will take action to, you know, either stop the enemy or overcome the injustice or to, you know, become happier. And so, um, and then stories, like I mentioned, they're a great way, way to do that either with real customers that have experienced those things, or, um, it could be a story about how the product or service came to be. If it's, especially if it's a solution to a problem, you know, I had this problem and then I found this solution and now I'm making it available to you. And then, um, stories also, you know, they entertain and they keep people reading and make your company more relatable. So, um, so you could talk about, you could, like I said, you could do like a negative emotion or a positive emotion, or you could do both. You know, you could talk about how awful their current situation is, which would be fear or anger, and then talk about how wonderful their life will be after, which is happy or hopeful. And so, um, but the point of all that is that you focus on the benefits that the customer gets and the emotion that they feel from it, not the features of the products. And so you've heard a lot of copywriting experts, probably they say, uh, features tell, but benefits sell. And so to kind of um, demonstrate this point, one of the best things that I, I've learned and that I use all the time is, I think this comes from Clayton Makepeace. He's a famous copywriter and it's called, well, I don't know what he calls it exactly. I call it the so what test. And so basically whenever you list a feature, so, you, so what you do is you take your feature and then you say, well, so what? And then you answer it. And then after you answer that, you say, well, so what? And then you answer it again. So your feature might be, um, well, I had an example, actually. So I have a standing desk. Uh -huh. And so one of the features of the standing, I'm actually sitting now, but one of the features of the desk might be that it can raise or lower a quarter inch at a time. And you're like, okay, well, so what? I don't care. Like, I just want it to go <laughs> up and down. I don't care if it's a quarter inch at a time. Well, that means that it can be adjusted for any height. Well, so what? Well, you could change it easily throughout the day. Well, so what? Well, it makes working at your desk easier and puts less strain on your body and your neck and you can make small changes throughout the day. Well, so what? And you just keep going down, down, down until you get to the emotional reason for that feature. And so then when you present the feature in your copy, you know, you would say instead of saying, oh, it can raise and lower a quarter of an inch at a time, you would say, you know, this desk is great because it raises a a quarter inch at a time, you won't ever have neck fatigue because you can adjust it at any moment with the click of a button. And you know, it's so easy and simple. You'll live longer and spend less on your health insurance. Yeah, there you go. That's so great. another, another little example I had, um, was let's say a can of mixed nuts, which I have here. Um, this can says that it has 50% less peanuts or no, less what? than 50% peanuts. And you're like, okay, so what? Well, there's more almonds, cashews, hazelnuts, and pecans. Well, so what? The can won't be full of peanuts. So what? You get more value for your money. And, you know, you just keep going on and on. Um, another term I hear people say is which means. So instead of so what, you could say which means. So the can won't be full of peanuts, which means you get more value for your money. And so you just kind of drill down like that until you get to where you – can't really get any deeper. And then that's like your deepest emotional benefit. And sometimes you have to put it away and come back, you know, later with a fresh mind and try to think of, you know, even deeper, um, I guess, answers to the question. And so by doing that, the deeper the benefits are, um, the more emotional and more persuasive they'll be. And that will convince your reader to act. And then that once you have that deepest benefit, that's what you can use in your headline to get attention and draw people in. You can use it in your first story. And then also, you know, like your call to action, you can say, remember, it has 50% less peanuts. <laughs> I, I love the fact that you, you've mentioned the word, and, and this is important to me because I, I've been told this a lot. You mentioned the word story a lot. And I know that one of the things that I have trouble doing is, again, as, as an engineer type personality, um, I tend to focus more on details and, and data than I do on stories. And I constantly reminded when I do speaking events, when I write books, that data's nice and facts are important, but people aren't going to, going to absorb that data. They're not going to absorb those facts if you just lay it out like a textbook. They're right. going to absorb those facts when you tell it in a story and the story relays those facts in a way that it can be remembered. People remember stories, they don't remember facts. So I, I think this is just a great reminder that when you're writing copy, it's the same as speaking, it's the same as writing books, it's the same as anytime you're communicating, if you want people to remember what you're talking about, remember what you're saying, give them a story that allows them to kind of put the information into context because people remember the story long after they've, they've, they've forgotten the data and the facts. Right, 
Mm-hmm. And I think it also, oh, go ahead, Christina. Oh, <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I was going to make up another example. Like, you know, if you say, I don't know, 50,000 otters a year killed somehow. And you're like, okay, well, that's terrible. I mean, otters are adorable and I don't want them to be killed, but it's just kind of that number's just gone, right? What but if you start mean? by saying, you know, Clifford, the adorable otter was, you know, making his way down the beach and then this thing happened and, you know, now he didn't make it. And he's one of 50,000 that this happens to every year. You're like, oh my gosh, that's poor so Clifford. That's so sad. friends. Like, <laughs> And, and then so it's your emotional response that you're talking about, right? right. You just, you, you change that into a story and it evokes that emotion and then you get them to act based on that emotion or a benefit of buying whatever it is you're trying to sell them um, because it's going to solve their problem. So that's, that's really cool. So I love all these tips you've given us, a lot of really solid concrete tips about how to make the most compelling copywriting. And it sounds like you have really used your copywriting expertise to launch another business called Comfy Earrings. And I would love to hear a little bit more about that and how the, your expertise in the copywriting specifically has grown that business. Okay. Well, um, so we launched almost nine years ago. So just a couple years after I learned about copywriting. So I didn't know a whole lot then. Um, and I actually messed up a lot in the beginning. So, you know, you can mess up a lot and still be successful. <laughs> so um, I think the key is just to always be improving. You know, like if, if it's not good and you're not getting the results you want, you know, you do test or you change things until you eventually are getting the results. And that's one of the things I like the best about um, the internet and working online is that you can change things any time. You know, if you say, I suspect this headline's not doing well, you could just set up a new test right then. And, you know, within a few weeks, you'll know if it was the headline or not. Um, so when I first launched our business, I used, you know, the principles of good copywriting that we talked about, the one big idea, focusing on the benefits instead of the features, using the so what. And I did all those things to write our first website. And then um, I used testing and customer feedback to refine it over time, to refine, you know, not only our website, but also our ads and our messaging. And then now, even now we're still, we run ads quite often and uh, well, constantly, I guess you'd say, and we're always working on making it better. And, you know, anytime we have an ad that performs really well, I say, well, what is it about this ad that's done well? I'm going to take that and I'm going to set up a test and run a test on our website and see if we can improve upon what's there. So if you go to our website now, um, you know, the copy that's there is what has performed the best currently. Um, we could change it tomorrow, you know, based on a test that we're running. And so it's just constantly changing and improving. And then, um, you know, I still write for clients, but I really like having a business where it's kind of like my lab. You know, I get to go try things and find out what works and what doesn't, and then go tell my clients, Hey, I'm doing this thing and you, it's working out really well. So have you tried this idea? And so it's kind of a, it gives me multiple benefits too. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. And do you do all the copywriting in your business or do you ever hire anything out as, as I guess, obviously if you're good at it, you don't need to hire it out, but is there, are there times when it's better to hire out copywriting versus do it yourself? Are there certain types of copywriting that other people might be better at that you, that, that you're not good at or how does that work in your business? So um, initially I wrote all of the copy that's on like the main pages of the website, you know, homepage, about page, um, our guarantee page, you know, just all of the core content that you would need to have. And then over time we have a, um, a team of two people. And so over time, some of that stuff has been changed out just based on, you know, questions that have been asked. And so we've added stuff. But um, recently I, well, I guess not recently, I wanted to have a blog on that site for quite a while. And it was just something I just never got to. You know, when it came time to, it was kind of like pulling teeth for one thing. I never really, I don't have much interest in jewelry or earrings. And the entire reason I started the company is because I wanted to put my earrings in and completely forget about them. So it kind of makes it hard to, you know, do research about different types of metals and things when you just don't really have that much interest in it. And so, um, we started hiring writers. And so, you know, I also, I know a lot of writers from the other side of my life. And so I started hiring writers to work on our blog. And so I think we have, maybe five posts up now that other people have written. So now it's become much more of like a joint effort. Excellent. And, and where do we go to find copywriters um, if we as business owners are not comfortable doing it ourselves? So um, there's a variety of places. My, I think my favorite would probably be going on um, something like LinkedIn and then visiting their personal websites and checking out their websites and then, you know, hiring somebody that you're impressed with. Um, there are also many job boards and then, um, AWAI that I mentioned earlier, they have a website and on there they have a, um, it's called direct response jobs and it's a place where 
employers or business owners and people like that, marketers can post a job. And then the copywriters who have learned from AWAI, American Writers and Artists, um, they can apply for those jobs. So it's kind of like a thing to kind of hook you up. Um, I've heard people have a lot of success with Elance and I think they changed the name of that now to Upwork, I think. Yes, that's it. I was like, I can't remember it at all, but if someone were to say it. Yeah, so they changed that. Um, and I hear a lot of people have success with that. I've never personally tried it, but it. that could be a potential place. Excellent. Thank awesome. you. And, and for those of us who might want to give copywriting ourselves a try, um, can you recommend any good books or courses or websites where we can go to basically uh, hone our own copywriting skills? Okay. Well, I do have to mention um, awai.com because that's where I learned and I still feel like it's the best resource. Um, I actually do quite a bit of work with them still and I go to their annual conference. Um, and so I would highly suggest them. They're really great. And that's a complete course. Um, other books that I personally use, um, I just looked at my bookshelf real quick and I've got, this one is from Dan Kennedy. It's called The Ultimate Sales Letter. And it's really good for walking you through, you know, the process we just talked about with the 10 page, 20 page sales letters and, you know, all the different, actually I just flipped open and we had talked about the creative or we had talked about using a PS at the end. You see right there, the creative PS. There it is. Uh, so like, the whole it it. Yeah. It walks you through that entire process. And so that book is really good. Another one that's kind of similar that I really enjoyed was um, how to write copy that sells by Ray Edwards and any book by either of these two people is great. And then, and Bob Bly, of course, which I, sh he's probably on the top of my list. So all of his books are probably all in one place together. So AWAI.com, Dan Kennedy, Ray Edwards, and Bob Bly. Are and one more, I did mention Clay Clayton Makepeace earlier from the So What test or method. And awesome. he has this book. Um, I don't, there may be a more recent book, but this one was super, super. Two hours um, to more profitable sales copy. Excellent. Yeah. Super useful to me when I started. So. Excellent. Thank you. Those are a lot of really sure. great resources. Very informative. I love all these solid tips and really strong places to go. So thank you. All um, right. I did. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go. You're good. What you got? Okay. I do have a tip um, for people who want to get started with freelancing Please. or consulting, um, whether it's writing or not. But I would suggest starting small. You know, a lot of people, they look at this and they're like, oh my gosh, I have to know everything. I have to know how to write emails and ads and blog posts. And you don't have to know all of the things. So my suggestion is to start by offering one thing. So if you want to be a writer, it might be writing blog posts. If you want to be a consultant, it might be one type of consulting. You know, you're going to help people get more leads or help them get more sales. You know, so you just do one thing. Um, and then I would spend some time brainstorming to get really clear on, you know, what that service is, who you're going to help, how you're going to help them and what the benefits are using the, so what, and then create a really simple website, you know, explaining who you are, what you do, who you do it for. And then once you have that up and running and customers are coming to you, um, you can start testing other ideas and adding in additional services. But when I started, I started with just blog posts and I was able to replace my income, um, with just blog posts initially. And then I added on emails and then I added on, you know, other types of copy. And eventually now I write, oh gosh, uh, the longest sales letter I wrote was probably, I don't want to say, probably like 70 pages. <laughs> wow. So but headlines write, to 70 page sales letters and everything. Yeah. That so I write a lot of again. things now, but you can start with just blog posts, even like 500 words. So. Excellent. Thank you. Those are great hmm. tips. Okay, Christina, before we jump into the final segment of the show, I'd love to ask if you had to give one tip to our audience, to our listeners for writing better, better copy, what is the best tip that you can give them? Okay. Um, hmm. Well, other than focusing on one thing, that's probably the most important thing. Okay. Um, the other thing would be, you know, answering the question, your reader always has this question in their mind and you'll hear a lot of copywriting experts talk about this. The question that they have is what's in it for me? So, you know, what's in it for me? What will I get out of this? How will you help me? And that's what they want to know. You know, they don't want to know all about you. They want to know how the things about you are going to help them. And so by answering those questions, you can get a much better response than if you talk about yourself or your services. So, I see a lot of websites, they start with, you know, I'm experienced with X. I went to school for Y. I learned how to write from Z. And they just go on and on about all of their qualifications. And the reader's sitting there going, well, okay, but what does this have to do with me? What do I get out of this? So instead, you might say, um, I can help you achieve results because I have five years of experience with real estate. Or you'll get results from me because I spent 10 years in school studying marketing. And so you start with them. What are they going to get out of it? And then um, you use your achievements as proof. 
right? So you're going to get results and I can prove it because I have five years of experience in real estate rather than saying I have five years of experience because they're just going to be like, well, okay, so what? Whatever. Right? So what? What does that back, get me? Back to the so what. That's right. So right. yeah, that's an awesome, awesome tip. Just the what's in it for me and put that front and center and it's going to get them to react better. Yeah. And then also keeps them, you know, more engaged because it's about them and using you. Another tip is to use you a lot instead of I. So anytime you have, I try to cut that out. And then anytime you can use you speaking to the reader, it's always better. So, you know, if you read this, you'll get these results or let me show you this thing. That is awesome. So one last thing, building on all this, you've got all these great tips, the, all the what's in it for me, all the big one thing, all the framework and flow. Are there any websites that are popular that, um, that you consider like really excellent examples of copywriting? Sure. Um, so one of my favorites is always Duluth Trading. Have either of you, are you familiar with Duluth Trading? I'm not. I'm not either. Okay. So it's a clothing company. They sell durable clothing uh, for people who work outside. Well, who work inside, I guess, as well, if it needs to be durable, but who work outside and who adventure outside and who need, you know, durable, uh, sun-resistant, weather-resistant clothes. And so their products are always really full of features. Like um, I was just looking before we got on here, and it was a crouch gusset and abrasion-resistant, and you're just kind of like, okay, so what, right? And so, but their copy doesn't stop there. Their copy actually explains why you would want these things. And so it's just, it seems like somebody there, you know, took the so what test. Um, so, you know, the crouch gusset lets you comfortably bend and crouch. And then the triple, seams, the triple stitched seams won't rip out while you're working. And then uh, I love this one because for the size of the cargo pants, they do tell you the size of the cargo pants, but then they also say they're perfect for a box cutter or a tape measure, which I just <laughs> really like because it doesn't just say, okay, you know, four by six inches and you're just kind of like, what is that? What do I do with that? Right. And so I just really like, and they also have a lot of fun with their advertisements and I just really enjoy um, kind of going there for inspiration. And then um, an example of a headline that I found uh, earlier today that I feel like it's very clear and it has good, you know, like it speaks to the people who would be going there, but I feel like it could be improved. And this is a good exercise for if you um, are trying to become better at copywriting, you can kind of find websites that you think can be improved and, you know, go through the so what test to um, get some practice. And so this one is from Spotify and you know, the music. Uh -huh. And so the headline, um, at least at the time that I went to their website, which they may be testing and changing it all the time, but it said, looking for music, start listening to the best new releases. And so it's a clear and obvious headline, but it just kind of, it kind of makes you think, so what? A little bit. So, um, you know, I thought, well, so what? Well, you could stay up to date. You know, so what? Well, your friends will think you're cool. Well, so what? So you don't have to spend a lot of time finding the new best releases on your own. And well, I said it's time already. And then so what? And so I finally got to um, that becoming your social circles DJ will be as easy as pressing play. Now that's and cool. So, you know, I just had some fun with that. And so it's just, you know, a way to like, if you go to a website and you read their headline and you just kind of feel, I guess, deflated, like... Yeah, like, yeah, what's the big deal, right? Who now cares? what? Yeah, yeah. Like, so yeah, then and, you can take some and. time to kind of you know do your so what, and then add on and add on until eventually you get to a deeper benefit. Um, and so it's kind of fun. I I don't know if you would contact Spotify and say, hey, I have a better headline for you or not, but some people do um, that when you know you get something in the mail from your local lawn service. Some people will actually rewrite the you know the postcard they received in the mail and contact that client and say, hey, I think I can do a better job for you. You know, here's what I've come up with. Will you try it? And that's one potential way to get clients. I probably that's wouldn't awesome. do that because I like, like I mentioned earlier, I like to hide behind your yeah, desk, behind, my, yeah, behind the computer. But. but the nice thing is even if you're not doing that to get out there and get more clients, it's just excellent practice, right? I mean, that's just one way you can keep honing your skill and keep just drilling down into that. So what question so that when you are working with a client that you're, you're wanting to be with, you can write the very best copy. There's nothing wrong with constantly sharpening. I do have one more tip for improving your, your copy. Tip? Um, and you had mentioned, Jay, you'd mentioned earlier that it's uh, hard for you to like write conversationally yeah. because of your engineer background. Yeah. So one thing that, um, that I found that was immensely helpful for me that you'll hear a lot of training companies uh, suggest, copywriting training companies will suggest to do this, is to write out by hand uh, popular sales letters that do well, that are controls. And so you can Google, you know, 
what sales letters are controls, what popular sales letters, you know, existed. And you can find examples of sales letters that people that copywriting experts say, this is a good example. You don't want to do it with just any random text. You know, you want to find an example that somebody like Bob Bly or Clayton Makepeace says, this is a good example. And then you just simply rewrite it by hand. So you, you know, with a pencil or pen, you write it as many times as you can over and over and over. And that kind of just gets you, it gets your brain thinking in that more like the way that a sales letter flows, the conversational flow and the tone. And you'll pick up a lot of uh, transitional phrases and, you know, just the, the way that information is presented. Um, and so just so doing lit that. Liter literally just write the exact same words, but basically that, that process will make you think about it as you're doing it. You'll kind of be training yourself without even realizing you're training yourself. Right. Because there is kind of a rhythm. Like when oh, you, you know, when you review sales letter, like there is kind of a rhythm it'll be like, you know, point and then kind of approve, you know, you prove that and then you have another point and you prove that. And so as you're copying these sales letters, you'll start to pick up on that rhythm where if you just read it, you might not notice that they're the same way. But when you write it by hand, you're like, oh, like this kind of, I understand kind of how this is like relates to that part earlier. You, you start to see patterns in the flow. That's great. Mm -hmm. Love yeah. that. Awesome. So. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> okay. So, yep, I think now we would love to jump into the next segment of our show, what we call the four more. These are four questions that we ask all of our guests. And then when we're done, we're going to jump into the more part of the four more, where you can tell us more about where we can find out about you and how we can get in touch with you. Does that sound good to you, Christina? Awesome. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. No nervous necessary. All right, I'll take the first one. So these are rapid fire style. You ready? Number one, what was your first or your worst job and what lessons did you learn from that job? Oh, okay. Um, I hate to like throw someone under the bus, but that's my, all right. Bring it. <laughs> my worst job was probably, and I still, I, I still think I have long-term anxiety from this. Oh, but. So my first job was, uh, or not my first, my worst, uh, was selling makeup for a popular uh, MLM, a multi-level marketing company. I won't uh -huh. say who. Um, and I just absolutely hated the process of like finding customers and then you had to set the appointments and it just always felt like I was begging people to do this and, um, you know, going to people's houses to demonstrate the product. And I just... I hated everything about it. Um, but I did learn a lot about marketing and sales and why people buy. And so it wasn't completely bad because I learned a lot from it, but it, it was not something I could do long term. I'm much more comfortable hiding behind the computer, writing things than I am going to, you know, the grocery store and saying, Oh, Hey, like, can I show <laughs> you my makeup? <laughs> Lots of different ways to sell. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, second question. So what was that defining moment when you realized you had the entrepreneurial itch? You've now started two companies. So I assume there was some point in your life where you said, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to go out and do this on my own. Well, so initially, um, I don't think I thought about it as a business. Like when I, when I started this, I kind of just thought like, you know, oh, I'll have clients. So I'm just gonna be working for someone else. Like I didn't really look at it as a business. Um, and then once we started comfy earrings, it kind of was like a hobby. So for a long time, it was just like, oh yeah, like I have an employer, they're my clients and I, you know, play with this other thing on the side. Like I'm not real. I didn't really start businesses. Um, and so it took a while, um, until I started to realize, you know, like, no, like, I kind of am in control of this copywriting thing. Like, you know, it's not the client telling me what to do because if the client tells me to do something and I don't want to do it, I can say, oh, I'm going to pass on this project or I could go find different types of projects. And so I started probably a couple of years in, I started being like, wow, like I actually am like the boss of a company. <laughs> <laughs> wow. How'd that happen? Um, I think with comfy earrings, when I started looking at it as like, oh, wow, like I have something here was when we started bringing on team members and I started realizing like, okay, it's not just me and my husband. Like now we have real people doing real things for us. Um, we recently um, outsourced all of our uh, shipping and fulfillment to a fulfillment center. And so that was just kind of like another layer of like, oh, this is a legitimate business. So I think I'm still... Uh, coming to terms with the entrepreneur word. I do use it on my Instagram, uh, in my bio, but I'm just, I think it's a lot of mindset stuff. I still kind of feel like, you know, I don't know. Nothing wrong with that. You're growing into your, <laughs> into your, uh, your new career and profession. Okay. I'm going to ask the third question also. Okay. So for those of us that might want to become copywriters, what's some of the worst advice you hear in this industry? Which, what advice might we hear that we shouldn't be heeding? 
Well, um, a couple of years ago, people were all, everybody was saying that you needed a website. And recently I've been hearing a lot of people start to say, oh, you don't need a website. You only need LinkedIn or you only need Facebook. Mm -hmm. And that is the worst advice I've ever heard because you don't own LinkedIn or Facebook. You know, even if you think, oh, well, they're going great. They're never going to disappear. Well, they could change something about the way that they do things and say, oh, well, we're not going to allow you to market your service anymore, or we're not going to allow you to reach out to these people anymore unless you pay us. And so when you build your entire business and, you know, the only way for customers to contact you is through a social media account, you're giving all the control and all the power to that social media uh, network or account. And so my advice is to set up your own website. And then that way, if something happens, your customers can still find you. And then you can still, if you have an email list, you can still reach out to them. And, um, you know, a website now is not very difficult or expensive, you know, for uh, 20 bucks a month, you can set up pretty much any website with a few clicks somewhere. And so that would be, I would say, take the time to invest in your own website and then not, I see, especially I see a lot of people that they publish articles and, you know, all kinds of content on LinkedIn. Like do that on your own website. Do that for yourself. <laughs> like, it's, like put it on your own website and then, you know, put like a little snippet of it on LinkedIn and say to read the rest to read the website. Direct them back over there. That's right. an excellent then, tip. Yeah. And then all of your, or all of your efforts when you're out in the world marketing or you're posting anywhere, all of your bios, everything should send everyone back to your website where so you hopefully have an opt-in. Um, we do on comfy earrings on my personal website on, um, I had some good and good examples and bad examples of, uh, websites. And I was going to tell you that my copywriting website is a bad example because it doesn't have a good headline. It's just a brochure website. It's like, here's who I am and you can contact me. But the reason for that is because I just, I have so much, um, like repeat and referral clients that I just don't use my website for its intention, which would be to get more clients, which at my current point, I pass those off to other writers anyway. So there you go. So it all works out. Excellent. So if you want to see a bad example, you go to my website. <laughs> good example, you got to come to that's, that's where I put all my effort. Is into that computer. is so funny. <laughs> that is so funny. Okay. The fourth question is in either your personal or your business life, what's something that you've splurged on that was totally worth it? Hmm. Oh man. Well, I mean this house that we just moved into, it, it's, it's probably a good splurge. We spent more than we were intending to when we were shopping around, but it has a really nice view. And I said, I'm going to be working on the back porch. So I need a really nice view. So that probably was probably the biggest thing. If you, if you had asked me a few months ago, I would have said a hot tub. But now Excellent. that I bought a house, a house is a little bigger than a hot tub. So <laughs> it eclipses the hot tub for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you've got a great porch view. That is awesome. Okay. So now we're going to go to the more question. Go ahead, Jay. So I'm, going to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit more about where our listeners can find you, get in touch with you, and uh, give you a, a opportunity to, uh, to talk about the awesome copy you have at ComfyEarrings.com. <laughs> okay. So if you want to uh, find my terrible website that I mentioned earlier, and, I mean, it looks, it looks pretty good. It just doesn't have any of the copy concepts that I just told you about. Cause I put all of that into my client work and into comfy earrings. So, uh, but if you want to get in touch with me there for, I do some consulting um, and things like that. My website is Christina Gillick.com. So just my name.com. G I L L I C K for those who don't have it in front of them. Thank you. <laughs> and the real website, the good one, uh, you can visit comfyearrings.com, like comfortable. So C-O-M-F-Y-E-A-R-R-I-N-G-S.com. And then I'm also on Instagram as Christina Gillick. And um, I'll tell you, do we have time real quick for, you to, for me to tell a, one of my biggest mistakes I ever made? Yes, please tell us your mistakes. Please. We, all, we all learn from mistakes. So um, on Twitter, you'll, you might notice that my name on Twitter is Comfy Christina. And the reason for that is when I first started using Twitter a long, long time ago, uh, my name on there was Chris Gillick. And I spent all this time and energy getting all these links pointing to that. And then Comfy Earrings started growing. And I thought, well, wow, I really need a Twitter for it. And I don't have time to do both. So I'm just going to change it. So I changed it. And within a few days, I thought that was a mistake. I should not have done that. Because now all of my writing links go to a random jewelry website. Right? Like, like people who want to see a writer, they don't want to see my earrings. They want to see me. So I said, oh, man, I'm going to change it back. Well, somebody else had already taken oh, Chris Gillick. No. And so I change it back. No. And, so, and they don't use it. 
Like it's just sitting there dormant. So I've emailed them a couple times a year asking, can I have it back? And they never get back to me. So I finally set up Comfy Christina and I started over. <laughs> wow. Good lesson. If you want to find me on Twitter, it's Comfy Christina, not Christina Gillick. I mean, my name is still Christina Gillick on there, but my UR or the handle or because they call it a Twitter handle, right? Yep. That sounds right. right. Comfy, comfy Christina there. So awesome. Christina, this was so useful. The actionable information you provided is just absolutely amazing. We appreciate it. I'm sure our listeners appreciate it. Thank you so much for being on with us today. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was so fun. Thank you, Christina. See you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. I really love that show. So as I know you do a lot of our copywriting for our business, you write all of our, um, all of our direct mail pieces, you write all of our listing copy. So you're already a great copywriter, Carol Scott, but me, I am really, really bad at it. And a lot of those tips are really going to help me. Well, I'll tell you what, first of all, I think you're good. I thought I was good, but I'll tell you what, after listening to Christina, I kind of think I'm doing everything wrong and I'm really great that I'm really thrilled that we had a chance to talk to her because I'm going to do everything completely differently now. I mean, seriously, think about it. The whole, the so what, the what's in it for me and the whole thing about handwriting everything. Seriously, that is all magic. I loved every little last bit of it. Great show. Thank you everybody for listening. Is that it? Do we have anything else? No, let's wrap it up, baby. Let's wrap it up. She's Carol. I'm Jay. Go write some awesome copy today and have a super awesome, fabulous day party, people. Take it easy, everyone. Bye.